Well, good morning, church. We're glad you're here today. Good to see you and welcome. Thank you, everybody who's in the room for wearing your face mask. Man, you guys are awesome for putting these on. I know that uh, we don't love it. It's not the most fun thing. Uh, if you do need a break from your face mask, just step outside and you can take it off and breathe some fresh air and that kind of thing. And we'll be, uh, we'll be easy going with each other and understand that if you need to take a break, that's perfectly okay. We love you guys. We're glad you're here. Those of, us that, those of you that are worshiping online or by television this morning, welcome. We're glad that you are with us. I think we're going to institute a new dress code here at First Baptist Church. I saw a picture this week of a man who had a hat on, he had sunglasses on, and he was wearing his face mask, and his t-shirt had a big picture of his face smiling and then an arrow, and it said, this is me, so that he could tell who was under the face mask. I thought that was a great idea. Uh, so if you want to wear one of those to church, you can uh, wear that with your face mask. We love you. We're glad that you braved uh, the current conditions to come to church today or to, to log in online. We, we're glad that you're here. Let's pray as we begin worship this morning and we'll go before our good God. Father, we thank you for all of those who have gathered in all parts of our city to worship you this morning. And really, around the world we have people tuning in. We ask, dear Father, that you would draw our hearts together in worship of the only one who is worthy. You, Father. We give you praise and honor and glory. Father, Son, and Spirit. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Amen. So for those of you that are here this morning, again, we're so glad that you've joined us today. Um, and so we've been talking about this week, well, how do we sing with the face mask on? And so here's what uh, the instruction I'll give you. We're going to, you'll see on the screens, it'll say solo, it'll say sing on the chorus, solo, sing on the chorus. At home, you guys can sing on everything. But here in the church, we want to be able to pace it for you. So if you're feeling lightheaded, uh, then, then don't sing. Hum. You can hum with the music. Um, another thing you can do is if you need to bring your mask down just below your nose, so that when you sing, what comes out of your mouth is uh, you're not giving anything, you know, any virus or anything, then, then do that if that's better for you when you sing. But uh, we just want to let everybody know that we're going to do everything we can to help everybody in our church praise the Lord and lift up their voices to God. I've been really pondering this whole situation about how we are now being limited in how we can sing. When we get to heaven one day, it says in the Bible we're going to sing praise to our God. We're going to lift up the voice. The voice is the one thing that God put on us that he created that is an instrument. And we're going to use that instrument to praise God. And so this morning, uh, praise the Lord with that voice in the way that you can. Uh, lift that voice up to God in the way that you can, because we don't want to let the enemy take, uh, uh, take control of our work. He is not here. God is here. He is in our midst, and we're here to worship his holy name. And so this morning, I invite everybody, wherever you are, let's stand together and let's sing about the blessed hope we have in Jesus Christ. Hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. His oath is covered in his blood, so pour me in the whelming flood, when all On Christ the 
is the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. When he shall come with trumpet sound, oh, may I then in him be found, dressed in his righteousness alone. All less to stand before the throne. On Christ the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. Amen. I love this next song because it talk so much about what we're going through together right now. And uh, even though there's a lot of fear around us, God's got us. <laughs> He's got our backs. He's with us. We're going through it together. And all the people said, Amen. When you feel afraid, you're not the only. We are all the same, in need of mercy, to be forgiven and be free. It's all you've got to lean on, but thank God it's all you need. And all the people said amen. Oh, and all the people said amen. said amen you are rich or poor well it don't matter weak or strong you know it's love is what we're after we are broken we're all in this together God knows we stumble and fall he so loved the world he sent his son to save us all and all the people said amen. Whoa, and all the people said amen. Give thanks to the Lord for his love never ends. And all the people said amen. Blessed are the poor in spirit and of heart. Blessed are the persecuted and the pure. Blessed are the people hungry for another start. Theirs is the kingdom, kingdom of God. And all the people said amen. Oh, oh, oh. and all the people said amen. Give thanks to the Lord for his love never ends. And all the And all the people said amen. Whoa, and all the people said amen. Give thanks to the Lord for his love never ends. And all the people said amen. And all the people said amen. I love that song. All of us can say amen, right? What our Lord gives us is he gives us life. He gives us hope. He brings light into this dark world. Lord, how much we need you. You give light. You are love, you bring light to the darkness, you give hope, 
you restore every heart that is broken and great are you Lord it's your breath in our lungs so we pour out our praise we pour out our praise it's your breath in our lungs so we pour out our praise to you only you give life you give life you are love you bring light to the darkness you give hope you restore every heart that is broken and great are you lord it's your breath breath in our lungs so we pour out our praise to you only it's your breath in our lungs so we pour out our praise we pour out our praise it's your breath in our lungs so we pour out our praise to you only all the earth will shout your praise our hearts will cry these bones will sing great are you lord and all the earth will shout your praise our hearts will cry these bones will sing Great are you, Lord, everyone. And all the earth will shout your praise. Our hearts will cry, these bones will sing. Great are you, Lord. It's your breath. your breath in our lungs so we pour out our praise to you only it's your breath in our lungs so we pour out our praise we pour out our praise it's your breath in our lungs so we pour out our praise to you only seated. Even though we've come to the time of our offering uh, and we aren't going to pass the plates in here, uh, we do have the plates available at the doors. I just wanted to make sure that everybody knew that before we uh, have our offertory prayer this morning. That's right. As John said, there are a number of different ways to give during these times. That way is one, placing it in the offering plates out in the lobby. You can mail it in directly to the church. You can set up giving through our website. 
or you can set up direct deposit through your bank. So don't forget, we still need to keep things going to further God's kingdom. Let's pray. Father, we come before you today and, and give thanks. Thank you, Father, for keeping us safe from this virus, Lord, and for, for protecting our families and just helping us through these times, Lord. Father, we just uh, want to give you praise and glory for all the things that you do on our lives. Lord, we just ask that you continue to protect us. Father, we ask that you give a blessing on this offering as we make it today to further your kingdom. And these things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. There's been so many wonderful things that have actually happened as a result of uh, us having to be uh, basically quarantined in our homes. One of the things is that a lot of the artists, uh, Christian artists I've seen, have collaborated in ways they've never collaborated before. Um, and this song that I'm going to do this morning uh, is called Shoulders. Uh, it's by For King and Country. Um, and they did this song. They did a special concert. Uh, and you can go on YouTube and actually watch that concert uh, if you want to get some uh, comfort. Uh, it's wonderful. But I just uh, thought that this was so appropriate this morning for what we're all going through uh, together uh, as a church, as a society. God is there to be with us. When he went to the cross, he bore our pain on the cross. And he carried that on his shoulders for us. When confusion's my companion and despair holds me for ransom, I will not fear no fear. I know that you are near. When I'm caught deep in the valley with chaos for my company, I'll find my comfort here. Cause I know that you are near. My help comes from you. You're right here pulling me through. You carry my weakness, my sickness, my brokenness all on your shoulders. Your shoulders, my help comes from you. You are my rest, my rescue. I don't have to see to believe that you're lifting me up on your shoulders, your shoulders. You meant what once was tended, and you turn my tears to laughter. Your forgiveness is my fortress. Oh, your mercy is relentless. My help comes from you. You're right here pulling me through. You carry my weakness, my sickness, my brokenness all on your shoulders. Your shoulders, my help comes from you. You are my rest, my rescue. I don't have to see to believe that you're lifting me up on your shoulders. Your shoulders, my help is from you. 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 My help comes from you. You are right here pulling me through. You carry my weakness, my sickness, my brokenness all on your shoulders. Your shoulders, my help comes from you. 
you are my rest, my rescue. I don't have to see to believe that you're lifting me up on your shoulders, your shoulders. My help is from you. 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 Psalms 122, verses 1 through 9. I was glad when they said to me, Let us go into the house of the Lord. Our feet have been standing within your gates, O Jerusalem. Jerusalem is built as a city that is compact together, where the tribes go up, the tribes of the Lord, to the testimony of Israel, to give thanks to the name of the Lord, for thrones are set there for judgment, the thrones of the house of David. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May they prosper who love you. Peace be within your walls, prosperity within your palaces. For the sake of my brethren and companions, I will now say, peace be within you. Because of the house of the Lord, our God, I will seek your good. This is God's word. I'm going to get it together here, don't worry. Welcome, church family. We're glad you're here. Uh, for some of you, it feels uh, empty who are in the room, but I want you to know that for those of us who have been leading worship in here, this is like triple the number of people that we've been allowed to have in the room. So it feels awesome to us, and we're glad that you're here with us. Uh, as you hear, those, uh, those claps may sound like not much to you, but to us, it's amazing, and we want you to know we are delighted that you are here. I, uh, I've been wearing my mask. I'm going to take it off to preach. Those of us who are leading worship will take them off so we can aid in communication. Some uh, need to read our lips as we are, we are talking, and that's, that's just fine. Memorial Day is tomorrow. When we commemorate the men and women who died in the service of our country, particularly in military service on Memorial Day. Today, we're going to add in first responders and healthcare workers as we pray. More than 9,000 medical workers in the United States have contracted COVID 19 as they serve and, and meet people's medical needs. Most have had mild symptoms, but a few dozen have passed away as they serve our country. Today, we remember those who have given their lives in service to this beautiful country of freedom. We are the land of the free and the home of the brave. The free are free because of the brave. To honor them, I want us to stand today, and I want us to stand in this way. If you know someone who has given his or her life in service to our country, would you stand up? Whether you're in this room today or you're at home, uh, maybe you served with some of these people in the military. We have many standing in our room today. I want you to stand in honor the military men and women, the first responders or healthcare workers who have given their lives for us. I'm going to pray, and as I pray, I want the rest of us to extend our hands 
to those who are grieving today. They're not just celebrating, but they know someone personally who died. As I pray, would you extend your hand with me towards those who are standing up? Let's pray together, church. God, we thank you for those who have fallen in service to our people. Jesus, you taught your disciples in John 15. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. And greater love hath no one than this, that a man would lay down his life for his friends. Jesus, of course, you taught that on the night before you laid down your life for us. God, there's sweet and wonderful news today that because of your sacrifice, we can walk eternally with everyone else who trusts in you. And Father, we also acknowledge today that we get the privilege of living in the most amazing country on the face of the planet. We know you love them all, but we're kind of biased, God. God, our country has for 250 years been a shining light of freedom, liberty, and democratic government to the entire world. We thank you for this unique and beautiful experiment called the United States, and we pray for our country today in these troubled times. God, we ask that you would lift it up, that you would heal the wounds that have been hurt. God, we pray and recognize that each of us have a stewardship in our country. We ask for revival and spiritual awakening among the millions who have never met you. God, call those who know you back to righteousness. And Father, finally, we are here today because millions have served our country unto death. We remember them today. God, we thank you for their sacrifice. We pray for their families and their friends. We ask that you would help them to stand a little bit taller today and proud. We pray that you would bring supernatural comfort to loved ones who have lost someone serving us. Bring them eternal hope, God. We ask that you would allow each of us to live grateful, humble, and worthy of the sacrifice that others have made for us. We pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen. Thanks for standing. You may be seated. In addition to Memorial Day today, earlier this month was the 75th anniversary of VE Day. 75 years is a significant anniversary. Victory in Europe, May 8th, 1945. And all this kind of Memorial Day and VE Day caused me to be thinking about a book by the author Philip K. Dick called The Man in the High Castle. Dick wrote many uh, science fiction works that have been made into movies. Uh, Many people know them, Blade Runner, Minority Report, Paycheck Adjustment Bureau. And The Man in the High Castle was made into a television series on Amazon Prime. Philip Dick's book pictures an alternate universe, a dystopia, where the Allies did not win World War II, but instead the Axis powers won the war. Imagine with the author what that would look like. In his fictional world, the Japanese control the west coast of America, and Nazi Germany controls the east coast of America. The Nazis have their large swastika banners hanging all over our American monuments in D.C. The Nazis have continued their mass genocides, killing people groups that do not match their supposed picture of Aryan perfection. And that only escalated because no one stopped them during the war. In both the Japan and German territories on American soil in Philip Dick's fictional picture of what that would look like, the government squashes any disobedience. The people don't have free speech. The people disappear all the time. The Japanese actually turn out to be the lesser of two evils and people sort of prefer to live in their controlled territory because at least they value peace and tranquility, whereas Hitler's Germany only values control. Hitler, though still alive, is incapacitated with syphilis and Martin Bormann, one of the most evil people in World War II, has become the Chancellor of Germany and our East 
coast. And as always happens under socialism, he demands total allegiance to whatever whims he might have as a leader. Even his under officers fear for their very lives, though they have served their government. That dystopia is scary, isn't it? As we celebrate Memorial Day, can we not just thank God that America does not look like that? Praise God. The world is fictional that he imagines. And and we don't look that way because of men and women who made the ultimate sacrifice and did stop the Germans and did stop the Japanese in that war. Millions of Americans put the good of our country, and we could say each of us, above their personal comfort. We're studying Psalm 122 this morning, and it's a psalm that celebrates the gathering together of God's people and the crucial role that each of us play in the corporate body succeeding when we come together. When we come into the body, we each must also sublimate or put our own personal convictions or personal comforts below the good of the church body. I love singing, and all the people said amen. And Karen said, and we're in this together. Man, that's true, isn't it? Like many Americans sacrificed for America, Christians must sacrifice for the good of the church so that the central hope of the gospel may reign in all sorts of people's lives. If you haven't already, if you'd open your Bibles with me to Psalm 122 or punch it in to your phone as we study the corporate body and individual sacrifice. This psalm is labeled a song of ascent. When you see that label in the Psalms, that there's really a double meaning there every time. First, to reach Jerusalem, worshipers literally had to climb up in elevation several thousand feet. Really coming from any direction, if they came from the sea in the west, that was at sea level, or if they came from the Jordan River in the east, that goes 1,400 feet below sea level. If they came from the Galilee in the north or Judah and Bethlehem in the south, from any direction you climb up to Jerusalem with the temple at 2,500 feet. Israel looks a lot like Santa Fe's mountainous. The Psalms of Ascent are labeled to be sung while making that hike up to Jerusalem. Once in Jerusalem, from any direction you come in the city, you have to go up to get on top of Mount Zion where the Temple Mount would have been. The second meaning, though, is also not just hiking up, but lifting up our hearts and our minds to God in preparation for worship. We prepare to come to God's house. The Israelites would prepare to sacrifice. They would be leading an animal one of the best of their herd, and that meant value. That meant money, and they were leading that animal, and the animal was making sounds, and they were thinking about, this is my sacrifice to God. Psalm 122 is about giving to God in another way, putting the body above personal comfort. You might say, hey, I thought we were in Corinthians, and well, we are. We're going to keep studying there. Uh, Pastor John led us uh, really well last week to think about our spiritual gifts, and we'll pick that up next week and continue thinking there in 1 Corinthians 14. But as we prepare ourselves for worship, and we get to open back to physical people being in the room today, and many of you are still in your PJs. Uh, Somebody here today said, man, I almost forgot and was coming to worship in my PJs, but I decided I'd put clothes on instead, so good job, Jack. Appreciate you doing that, brother. Um, As the rest of you, you're at home, you're in your PJs today, maybe you're thinking about when you're going to come back. Don't forget, put some clothes on. We all would appreciate that. But we all, you know, in the middle of this COVID issue, We're feeling it, aren't we? We're feeling people have opinions on this thing that are up, down, left, right, and all around. If you could imagine a spectrum and the people's emotions lining up on different places on that spectrum. On on one end, there's this deep concern over COVID. And people are worried that they might get the virus, they might give the virus to someone else. And on the other end is an absolute, not carefreeness, The carefree with the virus would be somewhere closer in. But on the other end of the spectrum are people who are so concerned about our economy 
and the destruction that it's causing for people to not be able to work or feed their families. And I want to say that all of those concerns on that spectrum are valid. They're valid. An epidemiologist friend of mine uh, teaches at Baylor University. Christian gal married to a good friend of mine who I went to seminary with. I want to tell you they love the church. Uh, she has her PhD in epidemiology. She's a graduate of her undergrad at Wayland Baptist University in Plainview, Texas. I'm here to tell you good things come from the plains of West Texas. At least I think they do. She says that uh, she studied epidemiology, has her PhD. She teaches it at Baylor. She says, you know, it is very difficult to understand how to read the information that the CDC is telling us. And she has her PhD in it. She says they are changing. She says the science is growing. They're learning new things. They're changing their minds. She said, can we just admit it's difficult to understand all of this? Man, I thought, thank you for saying that. She said, uh, if you even go to the CDC death chart, she said it looks like they revised their numbers down by half. They didn't. What they did is they took the COVID deaths and then they worked out those who died just of COVID, those who died of COVID plus pneumonia, and those who died of COVID plus something else. And so really what they did is they sped it across that spectrum so that they could give better information. She said, but I realize it's so confusing. She said, if you read it correctly, it it actually says that COVID is about 20 times more deadly than the flu. But she said, I get it. It's really hard to read it correctly. It looks like they just cut their numbers in half. You watch Franklin Graham. I kind of trust him. Billy Graham's son in the hospital they had in New York City. What I was trying to say about my friend is, uh, man, I, I went to seminary with her husband. If anybody doesn't work for the New World Order, this gal from Plainview, Texas, I'm pretty sure doesn't. And Franklin Graham, another person I trust. To hear him talk about the level and the severity of the cases they were treating in their field hospital there in New York. We have people connected with FBC. We have a couple of teenage boys, 14 and 16, who've both contracted COVID. Both are on ventilators. One is on dialysis. His kidneys are are shutting down. They are fighting for their lives. We have those who have lost loved ones in New Jersey. Those are valid illnesses. Those people are grieving. That is a horrifying situation. We need to be sensitive with it. On the other end, if a woman cannot feed her family, that is a horrifying situation. Like the salon owner in Dallas, for example, we have multiple people in our church who have lost jobs, who have been laid off and even saved, uh, you know, even if you have saved up a nice emergency fund, man, we're going on like almost three months. That emergency fund can only last so long. Dave Ramsey says 78% of Americans live paycheck to paycheck. That means they got two weeks of funds. That's it. He says 69% of Americans have less than $1,000 saved. You think about making it over the last three months if you have less than $1,000 saved. Ramsey says that's 69% of Americans. Can we just say, these are all valid, real concerns. And there are others. The government needs to protect its citizens. The government needs to not overreach as it protects its citizens. As I mentioned, science is learning and changing when lives are on the line with this illness and on the other end, lives are on the line with being able to feed a family or ruin a business and science keeps changing the things it says because it's learning. Boy, that adds to the frustration, doesn't it? And yet, it's only because of science that we know what a virus even is, right? Do you see that all of the valid concerns that are a part of this issue. Can we just acknowledge nothing about this is easy? This psalm has just been on my heart the last two weeks. And as we come as a church into this confusing and changing and volatile situation, and we even had to make policy decisions for what it means to open as a church together this week, I really uh, just wanted to study this with you today. Because I think it's beautiful and really charts a course forward for us as a church. So open your Bibles if you haven't. Psalm 122. 
This psalm, if you want to take out your uh, worship notes, there we've got some in the room, or if you want to get on our Facebook page or email, you'll find them there. This psalm uses the ring or sandwich structure that we've been studying from 1 Corinthians. Remember I told you that's an Old Testament way of using parallelism, and we see it here in Psalm 122. The psalmist will declare some wonderful things about gathering together as God's people. But then as he comes back and matches those parallel thoughts from the beginning, he then says at the end that we each have individual responsibility to make those wonderful things about the body happen. So it begins by saying corporate worship brings joy, and it ends by saying individual worshipers must be a part of bringing that joy to others. I was thinking as we, uh, as we sang, your breath in our lungs, so we pour out our praise, and I'm trying to sing through my mask. We pour out our praise through this mask today. It's part of what you guys are doing so well in being kind to each other by putting a mask on. I want to thank you again for doing that. So look at verse 1 of Psalm 122. I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. First, I want you to know and see that corporate worship brings joy. It's a good thing. It's good to be gathered today. It's good to be with you through cyberspace. So many ways. You know, we are commanded to worship. In our relationship with God, the right response to who He is and what He has brought into our lives is worship. It is the right response to everything that He has given us. That we would love Him and adore Him and thank Him for all He brings in our lives. Every good and perfect gift comes from above, the Bible tells us, from our God, the Father of lights. And so He has blessed us and we worship Him. But as we worship, the amazing thing is we get all these ancillary benefits from worshiping too. Worship really is about Him. He's the audience. We're blessing Him. And yet, as you know, He loves us right back as we worship Him with love and joy, with community and friendship. So we can say today with the psalmist, I was glad, verse 1, when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. It's a great thing. Worship is corporate. There's an us factor in worship. Notice that in verse 1, the play on I and us and we. I was glad when they said to me, let us go. The psalmist is glad to be brought along with the body that shares the same values. I've been trying to share my faith with a food truck guy that's open right now over the last couple of weeks. And we got to talking about faith this last week. He knows I'm a pastor. And and he says, you know, we really need this interaction with other human beings, don't we? It's not a want, it's a need. And I told him, I said, you are exactly right. But you know, Christians, it's even more than that for us. The Spirit of God inside of us cries out out for us to love the church body. It's a part of who God is inside of us, telling us to love one another. Great Baptist preacher in London, Charles Spurgeon, who had to close his church for a couple of months because of the Spanish flu. Spurgeon says this about this very verse and going to church. Spurgeon says, good children are pleased to go home and glad to hear their brothers and sisters call them home. He says David's heart was in the worship of God and he was delighted when he found others calling him to go and worship God, a desire that he already had. Spurgeon says it helps the ardor of the most ardent to hear others inviting them to a holy duty. It helps the ardor or the passion of the ardent, the passionate, to hear others inviting them to a holy duty. Spurgeon says the word was not go, a command, but an invitation, let us go. Hence the ear of the psalmist found a double joy in it. He was glad for the sake of others, glad they wished to go themselves, and glad they had the courage and liberality to invite others. He knew it would do them good. Nothing better can happen to men and their friends than to love the place where God's honor dwelleth. Church, I just want to compliment you on how well you have been the church through COVID. 
As we see more and more people coming back into the gathering, we recognize that you have not stopped being the church. The church did not close, amen? Church, you've been cl- taking up collections for the needy. We've had several different kinds. We've uh, taken care of our neighbors. Many of you have shared the different things you've done for your neighbors. You've made them masks. You've taken them toilet paper. You've done all kinds of amazing things. Things. We did a drive through baby shower, went cruising and loved on a family by dropping diapers on their, um, on their driveway. It was fun. We're going to have another one of those to celebrate our graduates and a family that's leaving us. You'll hear more about that during the announcements. We started a layoffs help fund immediately when layoffs began happening. We've been able to just write checks to families who are struggling. We have made 11 distributions from our layoff help fund to uh, 10 different family units right here at First Baptist Church. And the other distribution went to the BCNM Hope Fund, which is doing the very same thing we are doing, but with churches all across New Mexico. They have helped 10 churches to keep their doors from closing through the, the Help Fund. And they've given to 11 pastors' families to keep food on those pastors' tables. Church, that means together you have helped 32 families. Be blessed. And more than that, really, when some of these are churches. That's a fantastic, great job, FBC. Church, today, thank you for putting your masks on, even though I know it's not easy. I know it's not easy for some of you, but we're doing it for others, aren't we? We're doing that. I'm not sick. I don't feel bad, but I've been wearing a mask to make sure that just in case I'm an asymptomatic carrier, I don't get somebody else sick. So thank you for doing that. For many in our church, it's going to be a while until they feel safe to move back into public worship. And we want you to know that we love you. We've been trying to call you and follow up with you and see how you're doing. I want us to continue to do everything we possibly can to love our brothers and sisters in Christ, whether they're in the room or outside of the room. These are two cards that my daughter made to go with our collections, one for the Navajo Nation and the other for First Baptist Church Gallup. And they're really pretty. They have crosses stamped on here and cut out. And many of you who have kids have been doing that. I want to invite you as they talk about the Navajo collection and the mass for First Baptist Church Gallup. Parents, if you want to have your kids make cards, we'll Lysol them, make sure they're clean and send them off uh, down the road. But good job, church. So first, corporate worship means joy. Second, corporate worship means a compact and peaceful gathering. My version says in verse 3, Jerusalem is built as a city that is compact together. Now that's referring to the unity of Jerusalem, that they stand together. Together, But it's almost funny, too, to acknowledge as we've been thinking about trying to not be compact together physically, that really they were in Jerusalem. They were tightly fit there in the city. I was thinking and praying about this week, and you know what the Lord brought to my mind? It was the Lord himself imposed and imposes quarantines on his people throughout history. Did you know that? God uses quarantine. In fact, we might even be able to say that God invented the quarantine. You may say, what are you talking about? Would you know that in the Old Testament, that if a person became sick, you know where they had to go? They had to go live outside of the city alone. God was protecting the assembly inside of the city. It actually goes back to even before they came to Jerusalem when they were just a tent people wandering the desert. God put in his law that the sick must go outside of Jerusalem. God commanded for a whole variety of reasons for various diseases, various skin diseases, even women having a certain time, they had to go live outside of the city. We're not going to joke about that today, although we could, but we will avoid those jokes. It is interesting, isn't it? that God was about protecting the assembly and he put in this barrier of separation between the sick and the well or even things that could get other people sick. The way they dealt with a dead body, all the way they dealt with dead meat, there were all kinds of protections. Now I want us to drill down on this and really think about what God did there. It's amazing. Some of you may know Louis Pasteur. The French biologist, microbiologist, and chemist is really credited more than any other human for his discoveries of the principles of vac- vaccination, what microbes are, and pasteurization. Louis Pasteur, that's where we get that name from. 
He's credited with remarkable breakthroughs in science of how diseases are caused and how we might prevent them. And his discoveries have saved many lives ever since. He reduced mortality from perpetual fever and created the first vaccines for rabies and anthrax. Do you know that Pasteur didn't really get going on his research until the 1850s? Really even a little bit later, the 1860s. Our modern knowledge of diseases really starts there. The 1850s. Not even 200 years old. We only began to be able to see these diseases with the invention of the electron microscope in 1931. So we haven't even been able to see a bacteria or a virus for even 100 years yet. It's 1931. Think about this. Probably about 4,000 years ago. God set up the practice of putting a barrier of distance between the sick and the well. The sick have to go and live outside of the camp until they're better. Is that not amazing? For thousands of years before people had any idea what causes viruses or sicknesses, God protected his people. He used a quarantine to do it. So third, corporate worship is commanded in Scripture. But so is protecting the assembly. Look at verse 4 here in Psalm 122. To which the tribes go up, even the tribes of the Lord, in ordinance for Israel to give thanks to the name of the Lord. For their thrones were set for judgment, the thrones of the house of David. We have ordinances commanded for us to worship God alone. We need that. We are worshiping creatures. We will all worship something. We will make much of the things that we like and we enjoy. Our heart craves to make much of things that we think are cool. And we will sing praises to sports or athletes. We will praise the food we enjoy. But the Bible says it is sin to make any of those other good things our ultimate thing. Only God is worthy of worship. He's the only being that as we worship Him, He won't steal from us like an idol will, but He will give to us. He will fill us up with peace and joy and power from our relationship with Him as we worship Him alone. But it's relevant to our time now to realize that in the Old Testament, how they worshiped was regulated with many regulations, include barring the sick from coming into the assembly and sharing their sicknesses. Leviticus 13 is all about a bunch of different sicknesses and how people have to wash themselves. And, and it's amazing there again that God was calling people to clean and good hygiene before people had any idea that microbes can get on your hands. God taught them to worship and get clean. Listen to Leviticus 13.46. Leviticus 13.46 says, As long as they have the disease, they remain unclean. They must live alone. They must live outside the camp. I'm telling you, there's not just one or two of these laws. There are dozens and dozens. Numbers 5.2 says, command the Israelites to send away from the camp anyone who has a defiling skin disease or discharge of any kind or who is ceremonial unclean because of a dead body. All kinds of reasons that God commanded the Israelites to quarantine. So please don't suggest that a quarantine doesn't do anything because at that point we're not arguing with science. We're arguing with God. We must be careful in the things that we are saying. This is important stuff. And our society is being ripped apart. And sometimes, even we as believers are sharing things that are simply not true. As I've said, it's also a very legitimate concern that people are not going to be able to feed their families. We're hearing even the the biggest uh, uh, proponents in the early phases of quarantine, like Dr., Dr. Fauci even now is saying, we have to open, we have to open. I just keep hearing him say that, but to do so carefully. I honestly think one of the easiest parts in how to do church right now is, uh, one of the easiest parts is how to do church right now because both the Republican Party president, Donald Trump, and the Democrat Party governor, Michelle Lujan Grisham, are suggesting really similar things for churches. President Trump put out his suggestions this week 
for how churches can open safely. He's asking churches to open, but he's asking them to do so safely with many of the practices that we've put in place here because the governor had said. So they actually are very close in what they're asking churches to do. So whether we're in one party or the other, we ought to be able to say, yeah, you know what? I'm going to follow what they say. You know, we're commanded to worship in Scripture. We're commanded to protect the assembly. This past week, over 50 leaders in our church put forward our reopening phase one plan. Many people had lots of great comments on those things. They were thinking very critically about you and wanting to be a blessing to you and try to be fair. We're asking everybody to wear face coverings, as we said. You guys are doing that to protect each other. You know, I should care deeply that I not infect one of my older or immunocompromised brothers or sisters. And we're going to say everybody's going to take their own risk when they come back to the body. But, you know, if you can't worship with these guidelines, we ask that you stay away so that we can do this what's best for everybody. We are commanded to worship. We're commanded to protect the assembly. And we are commanded to obey our governing authorities. Church, did you know that? Listen to 1 Peter 2. This is serious business. 1 Peter 2. Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether to a king as the one in authority or to governors as sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and the praise of those who do right. For such is the will of God, that by doing right you may silence the ignorant Ignorance of foolish men. Act as free men and do not use your freedom as a covering for evil, but use it as bond slaves to God. Honor all people, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. Now listen, Peter is talking here not about some easy king to follow, not about some ruler that just loved Christian churches. Oh no. First Peter is written to Christians who are being persecuted by the ungodly, evil Roman government. Caesar, who had and was killing Christians at times. And he says, submit yourselves to the Lord's, for the Lord's sake to those kings. It's amazing. As Peter, listen to Paul in Romans 13 say something similar. Every person is to be in subjection to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God, and those who exist, which, those which exist are established by God. Therefore, whoever resists authority has opposed the ordinance of God, and they who have op- opposed will receive condemnation upon themselves. For rulers are not a cause of fear for good behavior, but for evil. Do you want to have no fear of authority? Do what is good and you will have the praise from the same. For it is a minister, the the governing authorities, of God to you for your good. But if you do what is evil, be afraid. For the government does not bear the sword for nothing. It is a minister of God, an avenger who brings wrath on the one who practices evil. Therefore, it is necessary to be in subjection, not only because of wrath, but also for conscience' sake. For because of you, you also must pay taxes. Well, we don't like that one, do we? For rulers are servants of God, devoting themselves to this very thing. Render to all what is due to them. Tax to whom tax is due. Custom to whom custom is due. Fear to whom fear is due. Honor to whom honor is due. It sounds a lot like Jesus. When he too teaches us to give to Caesar what is Caesar's. And to God, what is God? I think Paul had that in mind as he was sharing this here in our passage. Look there at verse 5. For their thrones were set for judgment, the thrones of the house of David. He's talking about David the king. And that God has given David authority to punish evil. And the psalmist is saying that that's an important part of, of their obedience to follow that authority. Now, our country was founded because people were fleeing unjust rule. And they created our government that allows us as people to have a part in the ruling. And that's fantastic. But it doesn't get us out of following those rulers who were elected to their positions. I need to say that we as Christians need to recover Christian statesmanship. Christian statesmanship. A Christian statesman. As he interacts with his government, as he interacts as a citizen, some as they get elected to office. A Christian statesman never moves off of 
his or her Christian faith, morals, and right action. A Christian statesman never gets pulled down into the mud of name-calling, gossiping, and slandering. We as Christians in, in 2020, we need to remember that slander is a sin. To slander is to speak a false statement that could damage someone else's reputation when we have no idea if it's true or not. A Christian statesman knows how to talk about issues they may disagree, but to talk about those issues in love, with honor, with respect, never name-calling. A Christian statesman knows how to disagree in such a magnanimous and attractive way that others say, man, I disagree with you, but I can't help but like you. And sometimes they like us so much, they want to follow us because we disagree with such kindness and such grace. Many of you know people like that. I want to and feel the need to speak to people in both parties for a moment. I know many are in between and not independent, but you'll get the idea. Republicans, if these verses are right, then God put Michelle Lujan Grisham in office as the governor of our state. She won her election. Peter and Paul, David and Jesus command us to be in subject to her. God commands us to follow her leadership. And if we don't like what she's doing, we have the opportunity in this amazing nation to call her office and express, I don't like what you're doing, but I love you and I'm praying for you. Last week, she said churches could only open at 10% on Wednesday. Many of us, including your pastor, called her and asked for equal treatment. And by Friday, she had listened. Two days later, she had changed from 10% to 25%. Now, she kept salons closed, and my wife is you know, still not sure what she thinks about that decision. I'm just kidding. She's just ready to get back to the salon. One of my pastor friends spoke with the governor. I, got, I was able to leave a message. He actually got to talk to her and was kind, respectful. He prayed for her on the phone. And he said when he, when he finished praying, he said her voice was breaking. He said, I don't know if she was crying, but man, it sounded like it. She said to him, a couple of people calling themselves quote-unquote pastors had called her and cursed her out on the phone. Calling themselves pastors. Christian, that is not who we are, Amen. We profane the name of Jesus Christ when we act that way. Do we see how serious that is? Christian means we are labeled with the name of our Lord. And if we give Him a bad name in this culture, we have profaned our God. We must not speak ill of her, call her names, or disrespect her office. But that does not mean we cannot disagree with her. We can call her and tell her and ask her to change. And praise God, she at least listened 15% the other day. She went from 10 to 25%. Praise the Lord. In two days, she listened a little bit. Democratic Party. God made Donald Trump our president. He won his election. The Word of God commands us to treat him with respect. Do you know what? In this great nation, if you don't like what he's doing, you can call his office. You can write him a letter. He too has changed his tune. He has been listening. He has been doing what people have been asking him to do. Not everybody. There's obviously a lot of disagreement. But getting on Facebook and shouting at the wind about these folks and calling them names doesn't do any good. Making accusations that we could not possibly know if they are true or not is a sin. Putting ourselves on equal authority with those who have spent decades studying medicine. Boy, that's prideful, isn't it? To think that I understand medicine as good as someone who has multiple degrees. We must be careful. And I want to speak pastorally. Man, I know it's confusing. It was so good to hear my epidemiologist friends say, man, this is one of the most confusing things. And I just loved a scientist saying that. And, and she was saying, you know, science is a process. It goes through this process of peer review. Somebody says, I think this is right. And a bunch of other scientists experiment. And they say, nope, you don't have that right. But what we're feeling right now is scientists saying these different things. And we haven't gotten to the end of the peer review yet. And they haven't really balanced each other 
out yet. John and I were talking about the press conference that our president did at the Lincoln Memorial. I don't know if you got to see that, but it was amazing. If you haven't, I encourage you to go back and and watch it. Uh, Don't watch commentary about it where people say that speech was bad or good. Watch the actual speech and and make up your own mind. So many of our news outlets, if you know that, they want to tell us whether something was good or bad, not just what was said. Please just tell me what they said. Friends, we need to pray. For those leaders, as the president was talking at the Lincoln Memorial, you could just see there's conflict inside of him. One of the reasons we feel the conflict is he was saying, man, I want to open up. I know we need to open up. I'm going to open up. The people are probably going to die as we do it. Go back and watch it if you haven't. It's, it's amazing to see the conflict inside of him. I've heard our governor feel some of those same things, I feel like. Friends, we need to pray for them. We need to be the best possible citizens right now because this is not easy. They are getting pulled a thousand different directions. The Christians in our society should be known by the leaders of our society as those with the most exemplary behavior and integrity. That we are praying for them even if we disagree with them. That we love them even if we disagree with them. That most of all, our God loves them even if we disagree with them. Do they know that from us? Have we expressed that to them? That our God loves them. I teach a Bible study with many of our state legislatures. Uh, Both sides of the aisle are represented. And I want to tell you, when you call them, when you write a letter that is respectful and kind and shows love for them, even great disagreement, it makes a huge difference. And I want to tell you that if you shout, curse them, call them names, write a disparaging Facebook post about them, even though you're, you're telling something that you don't know is right and it probably is wrong, I want to tell you it makes them hate their lives. It makes them hate their jobs. It makes them want out of that job as soon as they can get. I know because I hear them share it. Both sides of the aisle. And church, I want to believe that that's not any of us at all. That's my prayer. That we are the ones telling them, hey, we love you. We're praying for you. We care about you. You know, I really disagree with your position on this. I really pray that you'll change that position. And let me give you some reasons why. I pray that that's who, or if you think I'm being too strong, listen to James 3, James 3. So also the tongue is a small part of the body, and yet it boasts of great things. See how great a forest is set aflame by such a small thing, the tongue. He says, and the tongue is a fire. The very world of iniquity comes forth and the tongue is set among our members as that which defiles the entire body. It's saying a whole assembly of people can be defiled by somebody in what they say. And he says, and it sets on fire the course of our life and the tongue can be set on fire by hell, James says. Friends, we've got to be careful with what we say. Amen. We've got to be careful. Relevant to right now, the Bible commands us to be worship, to, to worship. The Bible commands us to protect the assembly, and the Bible commands us to obey governing authorities. Those all fall under point three. We're going to move fast as we move on here. Back to Psalm 22. Point two repeated as we come back around the, the ring. Individual worshipers must pray for the peace and prosperity of the gathering. So we saw earlier in the psalm that God's assembled people bring joy, and there's peace and unity there. What we see now is that individuals have the responsibility, though, to own that peace and unity and to pray for it. He commands us to pray for blessings, peace, and prosperity. And finally, point one repeated, the very last point in your outline. Individual worshipers must put corporate joy and the good of the... I'm talking corporate as in the body of people. Individual worshipers must put corporate joy and the good of the assembly above personal comfort. Listen to how he expresses this, verse 8. He says, For the sake of my brothers and my friends, I will now say, May peace be within you. For the sake of the house of the Lord our God, I will seek your good. He commands us to pray for these blessings. And he says there, I see that phrase, For the sake of my brothers and my friends, I will. Since we made our reopening plan, we had to make a lot of those decisions. 
the church leaders did. For the sake of our brothers and our friends, we will wear a face covering. For the sake of our brothers and friends, we will, we will do our best to love one another and sit far apart, not hug. Man, I wanted to hug so many of you today and just wrap you up in my arms, but I, I can't do that. For the sake of my brothers and my friends, I will consider their good above my own. I will consider what I sound like, how I speak, the things that come out of my mouth because what I say can hurt them. You know, uh, I think one of the biggest things we need right now is patience. That one day, uh, this, all the blue tape's going to be gone from the sanctuary. Praise God. We tried to have, uh, make it a little bit lighter with some jokes. Maybe I hope you get a chance to read some of the jokes on the end of the pew when you come back to worship. But friends, what it takes to have a society and a church who look like God is for us to put aside our own personal comfort or preferences and to put the good of God's people first. There's great good news today. The good news is that God Himself was willing to do exactly that. We know from the Garden of Gethsemane Jesus wasn't really looking forward to going to the cross. No. He was sweating droplets of blood. He did not want to do that if it could be avoided. He prayed that if it could be avoided, God, let it be stopped. But he said, not my will, but yours be done. Friend, the God of the universe gave his life for you. He put aside his own comfort. He left heaven and came down to this mess of a world called earth. He lived a perfect life. He taught, he ministered, he healed. And then Jesus Christ gave his life on a cross for you. Maybe today you feel like our society is pulling apart in these different ways. I have good news for this. We're all going to die one day. Our society is going to be a distant thought in our minds one day. But for all eternity, the question that's going to matter is this. Am I still in my sins or have I been forgiven of my sins? There is a government that supersedes all other governments and it has a king who is reigning and his name is God. And it is a deep offense to him when we sin against him or each other. And one day we're all going to be held accountable for every careless word, for every sin that any of us have committed. God is the ultimate authority and sin is disobeying that authority. We all have done it. But the good news is that God did exactly what he's asking us to do here. He put aside his personal comfort. He left heaven and he gave his life for us. The Bible says that one day we're going to stand before God and have to give an account for all of our actions. What's going to matter on that day is if we get to say, God, I know that I messed up many times in my lives and various in my life in various ways. But God, my only hope today is that the sacrifice of your son Jesus will stand in for my sins. And God, I'm telling you, I put my faith and trust in him when I was living. And I ask that you forgive me now on his account, not on mine. And the Bible promises, I mean, hundreds of times, if we have put our faith and trust in Jesus, on that day, God will say to us, well done, my good and faithful servant. Doesn't matter what ungood you did, doesn't matter what bad you did, but because of Jesus, God will see his perfect life as he's looking at you. I want to ask you today, have you trusted your life into Jesus' hands? Have you made him your Lord and your Savior? As you can look out on a world that does seem to be pulling apart in some ways, you can say, you know, I know I'm not perfect. I know I've hurt other people. But man, I'm looking forward to that day when the assembly of God's people gathered together around his throne and we all say together, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The way back to the Lord is to put our own preferences down, to make Jesus our Lord. He will save us. 
When I graduated from seminary at Golden Gate Baptist uh, Seminary in San Francisco, I wanted my 90-year-old Reedus grandparents to come and visit because my granddad, who then, he was in his 90s, he was a retired doctor. When he was in his 20s, he had been stationed at one of the main hospitals at the Presidio Military Complex in San Francisco. Before he went to flight school and became a pilot of the B-25 Mitchell Bomber, one of his first jobs in his 20s was to work for a doctor in the bottom of Letterman Hospital there in the Presidio. Beautiful hospital, it's gone now, but it overlooks San Francisco Bay and you can see the Pacific Ocean and the Golden Gate Bridge off to your left as you look out from where the hospital used to stand. My granddad was an officer in training and he was assigned to this doctor. This doctor ran the entire laboratory for that hospital there. And and my granddad told me he has these great memories of falling in love with medicine there and deciding that he would go to medical school after the war was over, and he did that. So I thought, man, as I graduate from seminary, I'm going to bring my 90-year-old grandparents out. It's going to be so much fun. They're going to relive all these great memories. And so they come. And we're looking around the day before my graduation, taking them out to the bay. And right where the hospital is, we kind of walk down to the water of the bay. And my granddad starts crying. I don't know that I'd ever seen him cry. He's in his 90s. And I mean, at first he's crying a little bit. And then he starts weeping and moaning. You know, I kind of envisioned this happy day, go look around. And I was thinking, man, I saw this happy graduation going a little bit differently in my head. He says to my grandmother, take me back to the hotel. And he said, Reed, I'm sorry, but I just keep seeing my men down in that water. See, his plane in World War II had been shot down over the South China Sea. For an old man who had been landlocked in Amarillo, dusty West Texas for a long time, Getting out of that landlocked area and going down to San Francisco Bay, all he could remember were the deaths of those that they saw as they tried to fight Japanese brutality in World War II. He was just overcome. So the reason we have this great country is because men like that and women like that put away their selfish desires and put their lives on the line and gave everything. We celebrate tomorrow. Friends, the church is no different. We exist because of the selfless sacrifice of the Son. And we too have to put away our selfish desires, our political thoughts, and come and put the good of all above the self. We have to sacrifice personal comfort and personal preference and choice, and we come to do what is best for one another, even if it means I have to put on a mask and I don't like those things. In the Old Testament, they had to go live outside the city Till they got better. We have some that don't know when they'll feel safe coming back into this sacred space. That should grieve us. But it also should make us even more committed to one another. To loving each other well as you have been doing. And crossing whatever distance is necessary to love each other. For God crossed the greatest distance of all. Leaving heaven and coming to die for us. He's our example. May we go and follow it. In the name of Jesus, we ask it. Let's pray together, church family. As your heads are bowed and your eyes are closed, I want to make several invitations today. I want to talk to the Christians amongst us, including myself. Maybe you feel a little bit of conviction today that your tongue has grown a little bit loose Over the last weeks, you've let the zingers fly instead of putting love and restraint first. You know, James is actually pretty encouraging about her tongue as he talks about all the ways that we mess up. He says, for we all stumble in many ways. If anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man. In other words, everybody stumbles in what they say. In other words, we all need to consistently re-up our commitment to let Jesus be Lord over our tongues. Sinning with the tongue is so easy, James says, and the good news is that God forgives. I want to invite us as Christians to recommit ourselves to allowing Jesus to be Lord over everything we say. 
when we feel called to disagree, that we would do so with great love and care and kindness. I want to talk to those who are listening and are discouraged by the state of our culture. I want to invite you to renewing your hope in Christ and His power and you being the change that you long to see in our culture. Your invitation is to be a living example of what a Christian statesman looks like. Would you commit yourself to that today? Christians, would we commit to what we say? Those who are discouraged, would we commit to living what we want to see? And finally, if you haven't become a Christian, I want to invite you to do so today. I want to speak to the non-Christians. As you are bowed your head and you are praying, I want to ask you just in your own heart to answer this question. Have I given my life to Jesus Christ as a Christian? If your answer to that is no, I want to invite you to do that right now. The way you do that is to put your faith and your trust in Jesus. You tell him, Jesus, I believe in you and I want your forgiveness and I will follow you. And you receive his example of putting others first. You take his death to be the death for your sins personally. Those are the three invitations today. John's going to play for a few moments. And I'll close us in prayer and John will come and, and lead us through some announcements. Would you pray? Christian, if there's been something unholy in your life, confess it now to God. He forgives you. He loves you. He made your forgiveness sure on the cross. It's so easy to let words come out that aren't right. If you're discouraged, renew your hope in Christ. This world is passing away. The Bible says what we do for eternity, that's what will remain. Are you living the change that you want to see? And finally, have you come to know Jesus as your Lord? Talk to Him right now. Tell Him you put your faith and trust in Him. Come into the arms of the redeemed, not the perfect. Be forgiven. God, I want to pray for every person who is doing business with you today. I ask, dear Father, that they would know your love. They would know your forgiveness. And God, that you would continue to make First Baptist of Santa Fe a shining light for who you want us to be in Santa Fe. May we live that every day. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. John's going to come and lead us through some announcements for the life of our church. But I want to say, if you made a commitment to Christ today, let a Christian you trust know and tell you what to do next. You're welcome to call me at the church. I'd love to talk to you about that. May God bless you. Thank you, Pastor Reed, for that call and challenge to all of us. And I just pray that uh, we would all take to heart uh, the words that God gave you to give to us today. Folks, there are many things we can be doing to help those around us. And one of those is to help the Navajo Nation. Uh, we are collecting food, uh, baby needs, things of that nature. So I want to go through this list here. Um, we will get this up on the church website. 
I, I will say by Tuesday of this week, uh, the list here, but we've got to get these things back by June 2nd. So uh, if you have uh, canned goods that you could give away, tuna, corned beef, stew, chicken, chili, salmon, uh, baby needs, uh, formula, diapers, uh, baby food, baby cereals, uh, dry goods like uh, dried beans and rice, uh, bread, uh, like bagels, cereals, muffins, and then personal care items like deodorant, shampoo, toothpaste, uh, toothbrushes, those kinds of things uh, would be wonderful. Masks. Okay, so that leads into our second uh, way we can help out people. Uh, we, we are collecting masks for uh, the Gallup Church, First Baptist Gallup, and so uh, if you would love to come and bring uh, some masks to the church, uh, those need to be in here by May 31st, so by next Sunday. Uh, but also, it looks to me like the Navajo Nation needs masks too, so bring double. <laughs> bring some for the Navajo Nation, bring some for the Gallup Church as well. Uh, then other announcements for today. Uh, we had a really wonderful turnout for the baby shower uh, drive-by drive that we did uh, a few weeks ago. And so we're going to do the drive-by thing again, but we're doing it for Lynn Lopez and her family. They're moving to California. And then also we have some graduates uh, that we're going to drive by their houses. And we invite you to come do that with us uh, on Friday, this Friday. Uh, meet here in the church parking lot at 5.40, or by 5.40, we will leave by 5.50 and caravan to the different places. Uh, decorate your cars, bring signs. Uh, uh, let's make it a fun event uh, f for these folks. And then I have two more announcements. Uh, the first one is uh, we do have a number of classes that are starting up here in June that are new, but the one I want to highlight today is Financial Peace University and the reason why I'm highlighting this is because if you want to take that class, please contact me this week. Um, my email is john, J-O-H-N, at fbcsantafe.com. Again, john at fbcsantafe.com. Uh, the reason why you need to get, to get it to me this week is because after June 1st, the price goes up another $30. Right now, it's $100 to take that class. We do have scholarships available, but we'd like to get those uh, registrations in bef by the end of this week. So call me. Uh, get in touch with me if you want to take shape. Uh, and then the last announcement, uh, for those of you who are here today, if, if you want to give your offering, we do have offering uh, plates at the doors as you exit. And, of course, for those of you uh, that are watching us online, you can go onto our church website and give there. There's ways to give uh, on that front page. All right, Pastor. All right, as we uh, close down, just want to reiterate that we have a chance to go cruising for the glory of God this week. Uh, some of you know what cruising was like in high school, and uh, we can come and do that together, 540 this Friday here at the church parking lot, and we're going to go to three houses and just take probably about an hour, hour and 15 minutes, something like that, and uh, just go love on those folks with a wave, and it's, uh, try to do that as, as safely as we can, be, you know, have distance between each other and that kind of thing. So if you're looking for a fun way to get out of the house this week, that could be a great one. Uh, we had a really great response from the, uh, the one baby shower we did that way. A lot of people so they really had fun. Uh, Kirk Peterson told me he's driving the Model T this time. So if you want to come see a cool car, you get to see, get to see that. Church family, let's stand together for our benediction and we'll be finished. Yeah, that's right. Thank you for reminding me of that. Um, some would like to know that uh, Pastor Glenn Strzok's, uh funeral is going to be uh, this Friday, this Saturday at 2 p.m. at the Light at Mission Viejo. Uh, they're going to have social distancing, asking people to wear a face covering if you come. But that's uh, May 30th, 2 p.m., Light at Mission Viejo. Great reminder. Thanks for catching that, Randy. Let's pray together, church. I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. God, we're so glad to be able to have physical in-person worship again. Thank you. 
God, we ask for safety as we do it. We ask that we would love each other. We ask that our church would be a shining example for a watching world. I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Amen. Dismissed. Thank you.